everyone, this is Living Football number seven, and today you will meet the best FIFA Fan Award winner, Marivaldo Francisco da Silva from Brazil, who undertakes a 60 kilometer walk to the stadium each home game to support his team. We will take a look back at the 71st FIFA Congress held virtually for the second time in a row because of the pandemic, and we will look forward to the FIFA Futsal World Cup 2021, the first FIFA tournament ever hosted by Lithuania and the third FIFA Futsal World Cup to be hosted in Europe. This is Living Football. It's great to have you join us wherever you are in the world. A warm welcome to the seventh show in our Living Football series brought to you from the home of FIFA in Zurich, Switzerland. The first broadcast here from this studio was the best FIFA football awards last December. Robert Lewandowski, for example, who just broke a 49-year-old league record by scoring 41 goals in one season for Bayern Munich, was crowned the best FIFA men's player. Lucy Bronze got awarded the best FIFA women's player. Serena Wiegmann, the best women's coach. And Jürgen Klopp, the best men's coach for the second time in a row. All big names in the world of football. But have you ever heard of Marivaldo Francisco da Silva from Brazil before? Well, you probably didn't, but his story touched millions of hearts around the world. Because Marivaldo didn't have the money for the bus fare, the 48-year-old began walking 60 kilometers to watch Sport Recife games. He never missed one home match of his favorite team, although he has to undertake an 11-hour walk every single time. For these incredible efforts, he was honored with the best FIFA Fan Award. The FIFA Fan Award for 2020 goes to Marivaldo Francis Francisco da Silva. Marivaldo. Because of the traveling restrictions due to the COVID-19 pandemic, Marivaldo couldn't travel to Switzerland to collect his trophy. So we send a very special ambassador to hand over the best FIFA fan award, a Brazilian legend, the eternal Zé Roberto. Eu comecei a ir a pé para a Ilha do Riteiro, foi mais por questões financeiras, né? E eu, com aquilo ali, eu me sentia mal, porque eu queria ver meu esporte jogar e não tinha recurso. Aí quando foi um dia, eu olhei para o céu e disse, Deus, o Senhor me deu duas pernas, saúde, disposição, e a partir de hoje eu não perco mais nenhum jogo, não. A minha maior alegria é torcer pelo esporte. A gente preparou uma surpresa para você. Oh, vai. <risos> e aí, gosto? Como é que você está? Tudo, Tudo bem? Oh, agora chegou a danada. Oh, essa é do Não tem nem palavras para dizer o quanto. Esse momento é memorável. Sair de, de Pombos, da cidade dele, para ir é, assistir o jogo do esporte, é, levando 60 quilômetros, 12 horas, isso para mim é, só defino com uma palavra. Isso para mim é amor. Hoje aqui para a gente, através do prêmio, através é, do amor que ele tem pelo clube dele, eu acho que isso é um legado que ele está deixando para essa nova geração de torcedores. Eu não esperava jamais ver você pessoalmente e próximo. Parabéns mesmo pela, 
pela sua belíssima carreira e muito obrigado por entregar o prêmio. A minha instituição, o Esporte Clube do Recife, para mim é algo inexplicável. São, é uma das razões de eu viver. These are the beautiful stories as only football can write them. Congratulations again to Marivaldo, the best FIFA Fan Award winner 2020. And as we said, the best FIFA Football Award winners couldn't travel because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And yet the virus still holds part of the planet in its thrall. So for the second time in a row, the FIFA Congress had to be held virtually. Last week, the 211 FIFA member associations gathered together via video. Football is hope, football is joy, and a little bit of football brings also normality back. And I've been very happy that FIFA has been able to help you a little bit. For example, with the COVID relief plan. 1.5 billion US dollars. This is unique in the world of sport. Our competitions are your competitions because you are FIFA. And in whatever we do, we always have to think about the fans. We always have to think about the countries, all the countries in the world. And we always have to think about the players. We want to make football truly global. And we want to do that together. Because we need you, the 211 FIFA member associations. We need you all to speak up. We need you all to tell us what you think, to tell us what you want, to tell us how we can make football globally better. The 71st FIFA Congress approved a number of proposals submitted by member associations. A comprehensive consultation process will be conducted to explore opportunities for women's global competitions, including a Women's World League. A feasibility study will be carried out to explore the possible impact of holding the FIFA World Cup and the FIFA Women's World Cup every two years. And the FIFA administration will make a proposal for the future of FIFA's youth competitions. The FIFA Council approved recently the third package of reforms to the transfer system. But what exactly is this transfer reform about? How can full transparency be created on the football transfer market? We are delighted to discuss these questions with FIFA's Chief Legal and Compliance Officer Emilio Garcia Silvero. So great to have you with us. My pleasure. But before we are entering the whole transfer reform, please, you are a lawyer. So why did you dedicate your whole professional life to football? Easy, you know, uh, it combines my two uh, 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 goals in life. One is law, you know, I love everything around law and also uh, I love sports, particularly football. I'm a big fan of Deportivo de la Coruña, my hometown in the northwest of Spain. So if you combine both... Big club, big yeah, tradition. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, we are not in the best moment right now, but sooner or later we will come back. Anyway, combines football, sports, combines law. And that's why since a long time ago, I'm involved in the football industry. So now the third package of the transfer reform has been approved by the FIFA Council. So what's the most important aspect of this third package? Well, first of all, I would like to say that uh, over the last three or four years, we have been working hard in setting up a proper transfer system in football, more transparent, more professional. And this is the third and last step in this process. So, you know, we are reaching the objective. So again, over these three or four years, we have implemented several measures. 
And now we are tackling three or four uh, specific objects or topics. First of all, we would like to reconfigure a little bit uh, the rules uh, around minors. Then uh, we would like to discuss about uh, squad sizes, uh, loans on, on, of players. Why is that? Uh, uh, you know, we can see a lot of clubs uh, in which the, the players are on loan many times. Players that, you know, they sang with a club and they never play uh, in this club because they are on loan uh, season after season. So we need to reconfigure this. We need to think about this. And that's why in consultation and in cooperation with the football stakeholders, we are also tackling loans, also transfer windows, and finally financial regulations. So these are the four topics, main topics of this uh, third reform uh, uh, package. One important aspect of the whole reform is the so-called clearing house. FIFA president Gianni Infantino said we need to protect the whole ecosystem and in his recent Congress speech he showed some very interesting numbers. Let's have a look. In the last pre-COVID year 2019, the global transfer spend for international transfers was around 7 billion US dollars, moving from one country to the other. The agent fees, players' agent fees, were around 700 million US dollars. And the money which went to training clubs was around 70 million US dollars. I think these figures are quite telling. And I think that we cannot be satisfied with them. And because FIFA is not satisfied, there is the clearing house. So can you explain us what does it do and when will it start? What exactly is the work of the clearing house? Well, the main role of the clearing house is to distribute the so-called FIFA training rewards, the solidarity mechanism mm -hmm. and the training compensation all around the world. So, you know, these two systems uh, were uh, adopted uh, by FIFA in 2001. But since then, we have seen that many clubs are not really getting this money from the clubs. We saw it just, you know. it's only 70 and million. And there is an unbalanced mm -hmm. situation between the total transfer fee, agents fee, training rewards and some other figures. So the main goal of the clearing house will be again to distribute this money. So a small club in Brazil or a small club in Vietnam or Argentina or Canada will get the money from FIFA. So the new club is obliged to put the money on the FIFA clearing house and FIFA and not the new club will be entitled and obliged to distribute the money to the training clubs. For us it's a highly relevant project obviously because the idea is that right now you know there is a big gap between this, the training rewards, the solidarity mechanism and the training compensation that the clubs receive mm -hmm. and the, the money that they should receive. The gap is around 200 million dollars, 200, 250. So, you know, we would like to put this money back in football and that's why, you know, we are setting up uh, and we are uh, working on, on this uh, particular project. So does the clearinghouse work like, like a bank? Is Don't like to say that, you yeah. know, work like a bank, but, you know, if you're not a, f a, 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 a man coming from the system, uh, I think that this is uh, the, the way in which the supporters will see this. But definitely it's not a bank. Uh, it's a clearing house in which, you know, you know the, the, the new clubs, those who have to pay solidarity training, put the money and then, you know, this institution will find the training club and pay on behalf of the new club. So. Can you give us a concrete example? Can you explain um, okay. how a transfer process would look like with the clearing house? Yes, it is easy. So imagine a transfer between, uh, let's put uh, a Spanish club, uh, Real Madrid or Barcelona or Atletico de Madrid, my home club, Deportivo de la Coruña. So imagine <laughs> that uh, Manchester City or Manchester United, uh, both or one of them, they are interested in a, a player playing in Deportivo de la Coruña and both clubs fix the transfers for $100 million. So, you know, the new club should pay 5% uh, of solidarity contribution. So 5% of the $100 million should be distributed between the clubs who train the player in a certain age. So, you know, means 5% means $5 million. 
So, you know, if the cleaning house is in place, the new club, in this case, imagine Manchester United, Manchester City, whatever you prefer, should put $5 million on the FIFA clearing house, and the FIFA clearing house will trace and find all clubs who train the player during a certain period and distribute the money. So will not be the new club paying the old clubs, will be this FIFA institution, the FIFA clearing house, you know, finding the clubs and making the payments. Amiri, we saw the increasing agent fees, 700 million US dollars in 2019. Why is FIFA now regulating agents if it did exactly the opposite in 2015? Well, I think that FIFA's decision made in 2015 was a mistake. And that's the first thing that we should clarify. So it was a mistake. And now we are trying to move forward and we are trying to introduce the licensing system again into the agents environment. Agents are uh, essential and are a very important part in the football transfer mm -hmm. market. And this is a project for agents. So this is a project- Not against know, them. Definitely. So, you know, this is a, a, a project for the agents. That's why we are in contact with different agents associations all around the world from South America, North America, Europe, Asia, and Africa. And we are talking with them. We are also talking with clubs, with leagues, with member associations, with the confederations. And the main idea here is to rise the professional standards. We would like to make the system better by including the agents into the system. So, you know, giving them a license, also uh, setting up a kind of education system for them and also, for instance, creating the, the, the football tribunal, the agent chamber, so a dispute resolution, a free dispute resolution system by means of which agents, clubs, players, leagues, they can come to FIFA and solve their problems for free, something that right now is completely impossible. So, you know, if you are a player agent from Germany and you are doing business, imagine, in Costa Rica and you have a problem there, so, you know, either you go to the ordinary coast in Costa Rica or in Germany. So it takes time. Uh, you have to invest a lot of money with this new dispute resolution system, the so-called Asia Chamber. We are going to create a better system for agents and for the stakeholders as well. And what are the concrete measures proposed? Well, there are a lot of measures that have been approved by the Football Stakeholders mm -hmm. Committee and the FIFA Council. Definitely, if I have to summarize three or four, I would say is first of all is reintroducing the licensing system. So agents should get a license from FIFA in order to operate into the market. The second point is uh, uh, transparency. So we are going to make uh, public uh, figures around the, 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 the agents, the clubs um, 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 and players as well. Education, so agents will be obliged to, to, to go into the system and to enter into the platform and to be really, really educated during their careers. Also, of course, the, the dispute resolution system. These are mainly the three, four main uh, measures that we would like to implement uh, later in 2021. Uh, some agents weren't entirely happy, to put it that way. Um, they claimed that they have not been consulted and, legally speaking, FIFA wouldn't be in a position uh, to regulate their work. But, I mean, it's, it's something that is contributing to their work, isn't it? We think that the system, again, will uh, increase and rise the, the standards of the football industry, particularly when it comes to the transfer system. So, you know, we are aware that there are some group of agents that they would like to see uh, other proposals, but we are working with them. And, and definitely there are a lot of group of agents all around the world, uh, the world and we are working with all of them. So we are still uh, happy at this stage and we think that sooner or later we will reach a, a, a proper agreement with agents and with the rest of the stakeholders. Muchas gracias. <laughs> Emilio García Silvero. Uh, I, I mean, uh, thank you for providing us with this uh, very interesting information. And please come visit us here often. It is my pleasure. Thank you very much for Muchas inviting gracias. me. Thank you. Gracias. As football is coming back to life, we are looking forward to upcoming FIFA events like the Olympic football tournaments in Japan, the FIFA Beach Soccer World Cup in August in Russia, and of course, the FIFA Futsal World Cup in September in Lithuania. The first 
FIFA tournament ever hosted by Lithuania. And in preparation for the draw, we are happy to welcome one of the biggest stars in the history of futsal from Spain, Enrique Bonet Guillot, aka the world knows him as Kike. In 19 seasons as a professional, he played 180 times for his country and graced the finals of four FIFA Futsal World Cups, winning two of them. And the world knows him as Kike. Buenos dias. Hola. Hola. Buenos dias a todos. Good morning. Kike, what springs to your mind when you look back on your hugely successful career? Casi pienso que es otra vida. Fueron 20 años maravillosos de carga deportiva. 15 de ellos con la selección española, jugando cuatro mundiales, Guatemala, China, Brasil y Tailandia. Eh, solo puedo sentirme tremendamente afortunado, tremendamente privilegiado de lo que pude vivir, de las experiencias, de los recuerdos absolutamente imborrables. Eh, tuve mucha suerte, mucha suerte por formar parte de este mundo del futsal y por poder jugar cuatro mundiales FIFA. But there was a special moment at the 2000 FIFA Futsal World Cup when Spain secured the first title and showed above all that Brazil could be beaten. Sí, fue algo absolutamente inolvidable para, para todos los que estuvimos en, en aquel momento en Guatemala, en el Domo, en el año 2000, 3 de diciembre del año 2000, jamás lo olvidaremos. Nadie pensaba que una selección podía derrotar a Brasil, que era la absoluta dominadora del mundo del futsal hasta ese momento y afortunadamente España con mucho trabajo, con mucha fe, con mucha confianza fue capaz de conseguir aquel título mundial que cambió radicalmente la historia de nuestro deporte y también del fútbol sala, del futsal en España. Para nosotros fue una experiencia absolutamente inolvidable, yo tenía solamente 22 años, era el más joven de la selección y a partir de ahí tuve la fortuna de jugar tres campeonatos del mundo más, incluso repitiendo título en, en China en 2004, aunque nada nunca es como la primera vez. Absolutely, and you repeated the feat, as you said, in 2004. What did that mean then for futsal in Spain? Fue el punto de inflexión, fue el cambio de lo que significaba el futsal en España hasta ese momento y lo que significó a partir de ese momento. Eh, entramos en las casas de la gente, entramos en formato parte del deporte en nuestro país, la gente empezó a tenernos en cuenta, empezó a darle importancia al futsal, que hasta ese momento quizá no había tenido, y para nosotros, tanto a nivel local como creo que también a nivel global, esos cuatro años entre 2000 y 2004, con esos dos títulos mundiales para España, cambiaron el panorama mundial del futsal y a partir de ahí España creció muchísimo. You will be assisting at the draw for the FIFA Futsal World Cup in Lithuania next week here in Zurich. What role does it play for the sport that the FIFA Futsal World Cup will be hosted in Europe for the third time? El, el, el impacto de un, de un Mundial FIFA es, es tremendo, es absoluto. Es el torneo más importante a nivel mundial del futsal y por lo tanto para Europa volver a acogerlo en en el continente europeo creo que es muy importante. Hay un impacto enorme a nivel local, a nivel de lo que sucede en el país donde se desarrolla el torneo, pero también a nivel continental, a nivel de lo que significa para todos los países europeos poder acoger de nuevo en nuestro continente el Mundial. Eh, yo no tuve la fortuna de disputarlo en ningún caso en, en Europa, fue tanto en Asia como en como en Sudamérica, como en, como en el continente americano y creo que es muy importante para, para España y para Europa el que el Mundial pueda volver a, 
a nuestro continente y ojalá la gente de Lituania y de, todo, de toda Europa pueda, pueda disfrutar mucho del de torneo. Kike, last question. Might seem a little bit odd, but what are the chances for the Solomon Islands? La oportunidad de disfrutar de un mundial. Mira, yo, yo recuerdo la primera vez que jugué contra Islas Salomón hace 12, 14 años y recuerdo perfectamente su respeto hacia el juego, su respeto hacia nosotros, como en este momento una de las selecciones para ellos referente. Recuerdo sus cantos, cómo cantaban, cómo bailaban al final del partido y eso significa que disfrutan lo que hacen. Por lo tanto, creo que el éxito o el fracaso a la hora de afrontar un torneo no es tanto el resultado final, no es tanto si ganas o pierdes el torneo, sino la huella que tú dejas en el torneo. Y estoy convencido que Isla Salomón, como otras muchas elecciones, van a dejar una gran huella en este torneo y estoy convencido que FIFA y el futsal van a dejar una gran huella en estos países también. Muchas gracias, Kike, because now we are taking a slightly bigger leap to the Solomon Islands. So thank you very much, Kike. You are welcome. Gracias a vosotros siempre. We are taking a slightly bigger leap now, as I said, 15,000 kilometers to the Solomon Islands. The Solomon Islands, a group of nearly 1,000 islands north of Australia, have represented Oceania in all four FIFA Futsal World Cups since Australia joined the AFC in 2006. The Kuru Kuru have only collected one win in their 12 matches on the world stage so far, but they are, no doubt about it, the Futsal Kings of Oceania. If you ask him anyone, Los Solomon, but uh, Futsal for a big game, big sport, Los Solomon Islands, where he decided that now I'm fourth World Cup daughter. Uh, no doubt everyone was aware that Futsal for a popular sport, Los Solomon Islands, and uh, for a fast growth sport in Los Solomon Islands, where every place in Los Solomon Islands where you go, what play Futsal. <laughs> COVID-19 has really affected uh, football in Solomon Islands. We only have one venue that uh, we can run this national league. And early this year, that, that venue has been turned into COVID-19 clinic. So we don't have any other venue to, to run this national league. We had to look for another venue for training. Unfortunately, in Solomon Islands, we don't have access to facilities that uh, other countries used to train their national teams for the World Cup. We ended up in uh, securing a venue which is used for basketball and we have used that basketball court as our, our venue for training our national futsal World Cup team. This for COVID-19 him make him in Waka. So through that for funding, I'm helping motor boys. I'm helping motor boys too for Asti Motalo side low finance and allowances. We taught him that for fun, had to by doing in training. Yeah. To be honest, I'm really proud every time me selected for the national side. Me always proud uh, for representing my country. Support law, FIFA law, COVID really fun. Yeah. We're looking by helping me follow Thomas for preparation for me follow this for World Cup. This uh, court and veteran lamp, side low safety wise. I feel no game 100% training sometimes, uh, but uh, so far so good. I feel everyone look good, both new and old boys. Everyone want to compete in the World Cup, yeah, so everyone train really well. I feel by go out of the training camps, I feel a lot cozy, and even for Europe, I then go for World Cup. Uh, what I feel expecting no more is I feel train look good, court, but I improve no more. Lo side lo tactical side, I feel I know what I feel gaining, and uh, for everyone go play lo this feel like standard court too. Team Forward has been supporting us in those areas and we really appreciate the support that FIFA has given us to carry out our activities and enabling us to fulfill our commitments with our football development in the country. And we are looking forward to see you in Lithuania. 
This project is just one of many in our forthcoming episodes. We continue to showcase some of the myriad projects that FIFA and the FIFA Foundation are developing, supporting and funding all around the world. We will bring you more about the draw and the FIFA Futsal World Cup 2021 in our next Living Football episode. We end our broadcast today with the warmest congratulations to one of the best goalkeepers of all time, Iker Casillas. The 2010 FIFA World Champion, who suffered a heart attack two years ago, turned 40. And Casillas told FIFA.com, for two years I've also celebrated the day I had a heart attack. That was the day I was born again. The whole interview is on FIFA.com. So happy birthday to the great Ica Casillas. That's all we have time for in this episode. So stay healthy and goodbye.